Hi, I'm Janelle Benjamin, founder and CEO of All Things Equitable, and welcome back to another episode of Twice as Hard. I am your host, and I'm here today with Sedrola Maruska, an equity and inclusion consultant based in central Massachusetts. Sedrola, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Janelle. It is a pleasure to be here. It's, I'm so happy to just finally meet you. I've been watching you for quite some time on LinkedIn and uh, taking some, uh, a listen to some of your fantastic episodes on your Diversity Dish podcast. And so I thought you'd be a fantastic guest to have on um, as we talk about you know, all things equity, inclusion, and particularly how do we um, create safe spaces for Black women in the workplace, right? We know that um, we, we work twice as hard, right? We, we go above and beyond our, our peers um, in so yeah. many ways. And a lot of people um, are, are not clear on what that means, right? Why yeah. is it, what makes Black women so special? What, where did that notion that we needed to work twice as hard come from? Other people will say, you know, we work hard too. We, you know, <laughs> I haven't had it easy. I'm not privileged, blah, blah, blah. But uh, no matter who I talk to and no matter what part of the globe I'm speaking to Black women from, everybody really identifies with this, this notion. So for, for me, like, I know it came from my parents, my parents were both immigrants to, to Canada and kind of put that in me to, to work twice as hard and to be better than. Um, I had to know that from a very young age in order to succeed. Yeah. Where, where did that come from for you? I think that it came from the zeitgeist. I, you know, I don't ever really remember my parents saying that I had to be twice as good, mm -hmm. but I think that in the communities that we're in, it becomes something sort of a mantra that is out there and that we all understand because as we look at the zeitgeist as we look at how things unfold we realize oh yeah i think you know if i am twice as good maybe i can just achieve just that level as everyone else and so it's for me i really do believe that it has, it was just out there and it has something that has permeated and that has stayed with me. And then mm -hmm. as I've grown, I've seen how, yeah, it's necessary. So would you say that, you know, when you look back on your life from, you know, childhood to now, would you say that you somehow instinctively knew that you had to be working twice as hard and be better than in order to, to make it in corporate spaces? Yes, absolutely. I've always felt that I've had to put 110%. And it's always interesting to me, like when I go in and I do that, how people are just tend to be so surprised at how capable or how creative or how amazing I am. And I'm like, well, okay, but you know, this is this is what I know is expected. If I am any less than that, mm -hmm. then all of a sudden, it's like, you know, it's this thing where we have to be kind of, which is sad, but we have to kind of be a credit to our race, which, right. you know, to me is like, what, what is that? Like, who, who understands that, right? But yeah. it's always been a thing. And I'm always surprised that people are surprised that I am capable and that I can do the things that I say that I can do. So it's well, for, for those who don't know what a, being a credit to, to your race means, well, share a little bit with with the audience. Well, it's often where, you know, you see someone, maybe you see a celebrity or you see an athlete, you see someone who has achieved something. And I think it was used a lot more in the past. You don't use it in those same terms now. And I always say that the language has evolved and it is something different. But there was this thing where it was like, oh, well, you're such a credit to your race, meaning that um, you make all of your people look a little bit better, <laughs> whereas as if we are a monolith and mm -hmm. as if this one person elevates us all. And we have this thinking because that is how we've been socialized to think. There's, right. there's always, well, you can, well, if such and such can do that, then you can do that. And that's really about representation it's not really about being a credit to anyone's race it's mm -hmm. simply about being able to see ourselves in places that have not traditionally been our own right. and so 
when you do something that you think is absolutely normal because you have lived with this idea that you have to be better and so you are better mm-hmm. and someone says to you oh wow you're you I'm, I'm really surprised at your your ability or not using credit to your race now, as I said, right. language has evolved, but mm-hmm. saying something like, um, wow, I'm, I'm, I'm that, that was, that's really great. As if, you know, I didn't expect that from you. Right. Um, right. and then it's like, yeah, that, that, that's offensive. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a microaggression, little... <laughs> right? It's a microaggression, right? Those, that yes. little indignity that tells us that uh they didn't expect that from us or our people or people that look like us right right and it's so it's it's sort of like when people talk about you know affirmative action oh they're probably an affirmative action hire and then they go in and they do amazing work and now it's like oh wow we didn't expect them to excel in that way and then it evolves and it becomes, oh, hold up. We cannot allow them to yeah. grow in, as quickly as they seem that they're going to grow. Mm-hmm. And so it, it becomes this whole thing like you, you, win, you're, 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 you win for, for losing and you lose for winning, right? Yeah. And so we, as Black women, have to be able to support each other and kind of be our own cheerleaders. We have to be out there cheering ourselves on and cheering each other on because because we know how much is out there to keep us down or to keep us from understanding or believing in the what we know is amazing about us and what we know because because we've had to be better then. Yes. We do that. And so when I say that we're amazing, that's what I'm talking about. We mm-hmm. are amazing because yeah, yeah. we we take that and we go, okay, bet that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be better. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be, I'm going to live up to and surpass your expectation because that's what I know I need to do in right. order to be in the running. But it also makes me an incredible human. So how do we reconcile that for people who, you know, who are watching the show and they're saying, okay, you, you're working twice as hard. You're, you know, let's believe them for a moment. Let's believe black women that they're working (laughs) twice as hard, that they are better than, um, why is it that they haven't made the gains in society that, that they need to, why are they not, um, why are they not heads of corporations? Why are they not um, you know, moving up and, and why are they hitting that glass ceiling? What do you say to those folks who are watching and, and sort of in disbelief that, okay, if you're so great, what's going on? Because I think there is, there is a fear factor. Mm. There is, there's this mentality that if you win, I lose. And because I'm already set up to win, I'm just going to keep winning. But if you come up and you show that you're that you're amazing, that you can do it better than I can, I'm going to lose. So I'm going to not allow that to be the case. I'm not going to allow for anyone to see your power. I, you know, I have an example which sadly sad to say is of another black woman holding me down. But mm. I started a I interviewed with this woman for an executive uh, assistant position, which is what I did for many years. And the interview went really well, and I was so excited to start the position. So I get into the position, and I'm, like I said, ready to go. I'm top of my game. And I, I'm asking for work. What, what I'm here. We've done all the, the needed stuff, the paperwork and all that stuff. What do I do now? Mm-hmm. And she starts to give me a few things to do. And because of my work ethic, which is yeah. what we're really talking about, I would do them, 
get them done, get them done. And which meant that I had a lot of time because it wasn't giving me anything that was up to my capabilities. Right. So I started to get more work, started to do, 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 do. And then I realized that I started to get less work mm-hmm. and less and less work until one day, um, the one of the executives calls me in and tells me that I'm being let go. Ooh. And I'm like, why am I being let go? And he says, because the office manager, who's the woman who hired me, mm-hmm. says that you're you're just not doing your work. Oh my goodness. And I said, what work? Mm-hmm. I am not being given any work to do. Right. But as I looked at the at the scenario, the office manager, she was the only black woman in the office. Mm-hmm. All the other assistants were white save me okay she was also always on a smoke break or you know chit chatting with the other assistants Mm -hmm. and i wasn't in that group like that wasn't my thing i'm like if i'm at work give me work to do i'm here to do some work and then i'll go chit chat with my friends go have drinks you know do whatever after work Mm -hmm. But that was her MO. And because I didn't join in, I think, with that type of culture Mm -hmm. that she had built, she didn't feel comfortable with me because she could see that I could overshadow her. Right. They might realize what they're not getting from her. And Mm -hmm. so I was like, go. And I said to him, I said, you know, and he said, I'm so sorry. I said, you know what? Don't worry about me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be fine. I said, but you should worry about yourself because what you've got going on here is so far beneath what you need. We, you know, you're in trouble, not me. Yeah. (laughs) And it made me so sad that it was another black woman. Mm -hmm. But this shows, what this shows is we're not a monolith. Those of us who say that we can do what we can do, we're not just saying it. We know it. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Because we understand that not because someone's going to challenge what we say that we can do and we have to be up to that challenge. So if a woman, if a a black woman comes in and she is showing you that she is capable, then you Mm -hmm. know she is capable. Yeah, your story just, you know, it's like triggering for me. (laughs) puts me in so many situations and I'm recalling, you know, workplace terminations and just the marginalization. I'm remembering one specific manager who, you know, hired me, eventually became threatened by me. Again, you know, I'm brighter than she is. I'm showing her up. Maybe, I don't know. I wasn't trying to. Um, And then the assignment stopped coming and my contract was coming to an end and there were no conversations about renewal. And I knew the writing was on on the wall. So I just looked for something else and I got the hell out of there. Like there was literally weeks where I I had nothing to do. Um, And it's, you know, you're wasting talent, right? This is what the loss is to organizations when you've got talented black women in your employ and there's somebody over them that is oppressing them, holding them back, keeping them down, keeping those good assignments away, marginalizing them because they don't quote unquote fit with whatever the the other dominant culture is that's going on, right? Either the smoking culture mm-hmm. or, or whatever it is. Whatever it is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's triggering for me because I'm like, <laughs> oh man, this is like, you know, again, another example through this conversation series where um, I'm identifying with, with somebody that I'm just meeting for the first time today and, right. you know, living her life, living your life in another uh, country, another situation, but yet we have this affinity, this similar experience, um, that I believe is unique to black womanhood. You know, a lot of people will say, well, I've been terminated before and that's happened to me and blah, blah, blah. but I believe that this, um, you know, the fact that we are excellent, that we were born and bred and reared to be excellent um, harms us in so many ways when people see it and they don't know how to interact with us you know would you would you agree with that yeah yeah I would definitely agree with that I think that you know there's there's this sound going on on TikTok or Facebook and it says I am not 
intimidating, you are mm-hmm. intimidated. Yes. And sometimes I think that we have to consider that to be the case. Mm-hmm. I am not threatening, you feel threatened. Why? Because you understand what your capabilities are and you're seeing what my capabilities are and you're going, it doesn't match up. I'm, I'm not sure what to do here. And that scarcity mindset, that mindset that says that there's only so much for so many tells mm-hmm. you that you need to then find a way to thwart me so that you can hold on to whatever it is that you have right. rather than being looking within and saying, well, what is it that I need to do better for myself? And how can I help and amplify this other person because they're doing so well? And at some point, get to there. You never know. I mean, if there's something that I also know about about many Black women and Black women who are excellent at what they do, they are ready and willing to help others because they know what it's like to be held back. So if you are willing to be a, uh, as um, Dr. Belay says, an uh, accessory to helping me gain where I get to where I wanna go, then I am also willing to be an accessory to help you get to where you wanna go and Mm -hmm. to share. Uh, the, The cost of racism goes so far beyond so many things and and that people don't understand. This being the cost of racism is that there's no understanding, there's no working together, right? There's no saying, okay, I'm gonna help you, you help me, the stepladder, helping each other up the, up the stairs because we all need to feed our families. We all mm-hmm. need to live this life in a way that is comfortable for us. And if we were to be able to just simply let go of whatever those biases are that keep us from helping others achieve, Mm -hmm. so many more of us would be able to reap the benefits. But cost of racism. What has been the impact to you then? What has been the cost of, of that racism and those actions to you? You know, they, when they say, you know, sorry, Sajirola, we no longer need you. And you have now to kind of pick yourself up and start from the bottom. How would you say your career uh, trajectory has been? Uh, So now I work for myself. (laughs) (laughs) So now I work for myself, which is a whole, which comes with a whole other uh, set of, of rules, a whole other set of ways to interact in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. But it used it would always make me go i it would it would motivate me to do better right? right as if it were my fault or my responsibility to take on what you've put on to me mm-hmm. and so i i am constantly looking at how i can be better how can i grow how can i and how can i help someone else who is coming mm-hmm. along? How can I amplify someone's voices, which is uh, someone's voice, which is you know why I do the podcast, yeah, um, yeah. and why I really enjoy doing it. How can I amplify you while also becoming a better me and a better in what I choose to do, right? Mm-hmm. And so that is that is for me the constant like. You have, it's almost that you have to be so good, right? That I, I've seen that before. You have to be so good that they just absolutely cannot ignore you. But why is it that we have to work that hard to be so good that we're so, so bright that yeah. you cannot be ignored, even though we're already bright? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have to be the standout in, in, yeah. in, in order to yeah. be, in order to be visible it's like we're hyper visible just to be minimally seen right right yeah. Yeah. yes yeah. would you say that you became an entrepreneur precisely because you've had these experiences in the workplace I became an entrepreneur it might might be that because I came became an entrepreneur because 
I never felt at home in an office. And I've been thinking about this for a while. You know how you watch television shows, you watch, you know, different shows and and these people work together and all of a sudden they're family. And I'm like, in whose world is that real? (laughs) I think that to myself all the time. I'm like, I may have had maybe one or two people that became my friends from, from, from work, But never on a team have I ever felt like, oh, this is my family. They're going to be there for me no matter what. And and it always boggles my mind because I'm like, this perspective, this may be true for somebody, but I don't know that it's true for me or for many Black people who feel that they go to work, they work to fit in and they work to do their jobs and then they leave and then they can take a deep breath and go okay now I can be what I want to be and then the next day they go back and do the same thing and that for me was really frustrating and tiring and I and I always felt that all that my talents everything that I brought was never being used to its fullest and so now I can choose to use all my talents and I can choose to continually put it out there so that you know, I get the, the the clients that I want, work with the people that I want to work with and and affect the change that I want to affect in, in, in this world. But I, I want somebody to tell me if they if they especially a black person, if they mm-hmm. go to work and they experience this family like situation at their jobs. <laughs> that would be an interesting conversation. <laughs> yes, it would. You know, my sister is that type of person. She often finds lots and lots of friends in the workplace, right? Lots of her her colleagues become her, you know, her greatest friends. Really good friends. She's got really great social life life with her colleagues, right? Um, It's really admirable in some senses, but in other ways, I'm like, what are you missing, right? Are you... What are, what are you not seeing? Because, you know, and it hurts even more than when that happens to her, the experiences that we're talking about, when they sort of cut your throat and they tell you, you know, look, because she's established that sort of network yeah. and that kind of family feeling, you know, they're her friends outside of the office and then something traumatic happens and it traumatizes her to the fullest extent in a way that mm. um, I think a lot of other people won't experience, right? We can recover um and bounce back and find something else and and there's don't get me wrong there's impacts to us I know for me personally the impact to my family you know my economic situation um it's insurmountable like I'm never going to recover right because it's you know you've lost pension contributions you've lost income for a certain period of time and um it impacts the family. I had to pull my, my kids out of certain activities that they were involved in because I couldn't afford to pay for them anymore, those types of things. Mm-hmm. Um, but the impact to your person, your mental health, your esteem, um, those things can't be taken lightly either, right? We've right. Heard, heard people become, you know, even suicidal um, after a job loss when you, you know, you tie your value to your job in so job. many ways. Yeah. How have you found entrepreneurship? Are you enjoying it in a different way than you did working in the office? I am. Yeah. It is. It's hard. Mm-hmm. I'm. I, you know, I'm not going to be the one to ever sh- sugarcoat being an entrepreneur, going out there and saying I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this myself. Yeah. yeah. It, it. It's hard. It's. It's. It's a grind, but it's also so rewarding because it's flexible and I actually get to do what I want to do and not what someone is telling me that I have to do, which have to do to me is, is such a, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to do, you know, to, to, to go through that. There are things that we do need to do in life in order to continue to be entrepreneurs, in order to be really good at our jobs when we're in in a position in order to actually be seen. But whenever it's a have to or a should, should, shoulda, shoulda, it to me, it just, it it grates against me. Um, But this allows me to be there for my family in a different way. It allows me to 
be incredibly flexible for my my parents mm -hmm. who you know are are getting older it allows me to have a, that peace of mind knowing that if i make an appointment i don't have to feel anxiety that now i have to leave the office and oh my gosh is anybody looking at me thinking why am i leaving and why am i leaving so often because i have to do this for my kids and this for my parents and this for myself and you know mm -hmm. i'm a cancer survivor there are a lot of different things that go I, you know, go to the scans, all these things. Mm -hmm. And so when you put all those things together, their life, yes. and we have to, we're socialized to put life around work, whereas yes. it really should, needs to be that we are living and that work is part of that life. Mm -hmm. right? It's such a different way of thinking about it. And so I've, set my life up in the way that right now I'm not living to work. I am working to live and to have this life and to be able to do all the things that I need to do in this life without the anxiety of someone looking over my shoulder going, well, are you? And, it, and yeah. when we come back to this excellence thing, I could be crushing it at work. I could be doing everything I need to do and have more on my plate and, and all of that. And still, and yet I would still feel anxiety about yeah. needing to live my life. Mm. And that, anxiety, that, that anxiety, I would say is another way that black women have a harder in the workplace, right? Because we're scrutinized more so than anybody else. Like, where are you going? how long was your lunch? What, you know, <laughs> you walk in the door and they're, they, they, they go like this, they look at their wrist. It's like, you're not looking at your wrist for everybody else. Did you, did you see how many times so-and-so took a smoke break or, you know, whatever went trolling around right. the building? Um, they're not looking and, at And them. you're balancing, you're balancing that anxiety yes. with, you're, you're balancing that anxiety with the, with the voice that says, that is not something that you need to be worried about. Right? Mm -hmm. So those two things are constantly battling. You don't need to worry about it. Oh, but what if? Oh, you don't need to worry about it. Oh, but what if? Oh, you don't. Need... And, it, and, it, and, it, and it's this thing that's just, just kind of there in the background kind of right. happening almost with everything that you do or every way that you show up. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you just have to say, I'm not listening to that voice. Shut up <laughs> and move on in, you know, with the within your power and that's not easy that that's not an easy thing to do yeah it's a it's oppressive right we we're oh, battling yeah. the oppression and yeah. the anxiety <laughs> simultaneously and it's it, it is a dance that we have to do more so i would say than anybody else and it's another way that we work twice as hard so thank you for that i want to ask you how are you currently working twice as hard through your business um, your businesses. I know you've got the podcast going and you've got a, an on-demand workshop that you wanted to share a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So my podcast, I want everyone to listen to my podcast, but <laughs> I know everybody won't, but the podcast is really about having conversations almost like this, where people are talking about what affects them or how, uh, how, racism has affected them in their lives. It also talks to people who are doing incredible things. So it's diversity dish. Mm -hmm. So I talk to a diverse array who are neurodiverse people, who are racially diverse people, who are gender diverse people, who are um, orientation, sexually orientation diverse. So I talk to a diverse number of people so that they can put their stories out there and people can understand I learned so much from mm -hmm. my guests because mm -hmm. I don't know what it's like to be a transgender woman, right? but yeah. someone can explain it to me. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know what it's like to be an autistic woman, right. but yeah. someone can explain it to me. And having that information really helps you to gain a broader perspective and a broader understanding and a compassion and um, acceptance of di people's differences. And then there's the racial sensitivity workshop, which is an on-demand workshop. And it helps you understand the language of social justice and racial sensitivity. So okay. what are microaggressions? What is 
what is racism? What is prejudice? What is discrimination? Mm -hmm. And then there's also a an acronym in there, which is L O V E U S love us, which is stands for a, it's a kind of a code for remembering how to tap into yourself so that you can be a better social justice warrior if that's what you want to be or an advocate and a co-conspirator co an accomplice whatever level you want to join in this work it helps you uh, remember what you need to do in order to to do that so those what does the acronym stand for what does it's love us L stand for? it's l-o-v E U S and it's an acronym and I can't quite remember right now all the words that it stands for, but it's like, um, listen, be open. Um, uh, uh, what is, uh, be maybe um, vulnerability. Yes. Be vulnerable. Um, and, uh, engage with people that are different than you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and so, you know, all, all that stuff that we can, do in order to simply be open and understand where someone is coming from. Understand that my reality is very different than your reality. My reality as a black woman is different than a white woman's reality. For sure. Um, and so understand that and understand that even when we're talking about things that are common to us, there mm -hmm. are things that are still heavy for me that may not ever be heavy for you mm -hmm. and and keeping that in mind and how can you help alleviate that because the dominant culture is who can help alleviate some certain things for us you know yeah. we we can shout and we have been shouting for years about so many things mm -hmm. and a lot of times no one hears until someone from the dominant culture says, hey, what about this? And all of a sudden everybody's like, wow. And we're like, <laughs> did you hear you know all about before? that? <laughs> yes, we do, we do. It goes back to that, you know, invisibility, right? Our voices yes. are, are not, um, yes. they're not listened to to the same extent. Yes. Which is why I also want to encourage people to buy books from Black authors. I cannot, I cannot express it enough. But if you want to learn about uh, social justice, anti-racism, equity, inclusion, diversity, buy books from authors who are from marginalized communities, mm -hmm. starting with Black authors, and go down the line. There are Native American, there are Asian American, there are so mm -hmm. many authors that do not get the their due yeah. because yeah. nobody's listening, but they have a lot to say and perspectives that are so necessary to understand. Read books from LGBTQ people, trans people, mm -hmm. autistic people, all of these people have a story that you will never understand until you open yourself up to them. Read books. <laughs> <laughs> What's a, a favorite book of yours or something that you're reading now? Um, I love, well, right now I'm reading a book from Stacy Lee, which is um, an Asian American, and it is called The Downstairs Girl. I just barely started, but it has pulled me in, and mm -hmm. so I'm reading that. I just finished reading War Child by Emmanuel Zhao, who okay. talks about being a child soldier, mm -hmm. right? Um, it is incredible the things that he's seen even before he turned 10 oh. and things that we will never see in our lifetimes but we need to understand so that we aren't so that we aren't making policy or making uh, judgments on people based yeah. on our you know reality our lived experience yeah our yeah. lived experience they mm -hmm. have totally you know just it's incredible to me what he has gone through um, I, I love, uh, feeding the soul. You see me looking around. I have all my books all over the I place. Know, I, I see you looking. Mine are here too. I've got a few. I'm like, I gotta read this one. I gotta read. Oh my gosh. I had a whole, I have a whole pile. I gotta read 
this one. Yes. I'm actually in this one and I haven't even read it yet. And I got to read this one by Minda oh. Hart. Oh, nice. Like, yes. Yeah, I got all my yes. I, I feel you. I'm like looking around like, mm -hmm, uh, I understand. <laughs> and then there are different ones that I want to pick up. There's perfect. I, I have Professional Troublemaker by Lavia Jaya Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to pick up One Drop by um, uh, Yaba Blay, uh, Dr. Yaba Blay. Uh, I'm uh, Hood Feminism. Oh, yeah. Was... I got to read that one. <laughs> <laughs> so good. I mean, these are all books that, that are meant to educate um, everyone so that if it's not part of your lived experience, you can at least understand, try to understand and try to relate, try to see how what you may be doing that may be contributing to some of these lived experiences, because we don't in, we don't live these experiences all on our own. There is a, an oppressive force that is causing us to live these experiences and you need to understand where you fall in that oppressive force absolutely. and if you are part of that oppressive force how do you change that absolutely right black women in 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 france and the uk and the caribbean and america and canada like we can't all be having the same experiences no if this isn't a system that uh is global you know right, um, right. i think that's what's really important uh through this this conversation series so Jarola, where can people get in touch with you if they want to to learn more they diversitydish.com is your website for the, the downloadable dish. yes downloadable workshop and yes. where can they hear your podcast diversitydish.com it's called okay. diversity dish so they can hear it there but it's also on itunes spotify uh, iHeartRadio, it's all on um, everything. Google Podcasts, it's everywhere. So wherever they get their podcasts, they can find my podcast or they can go to diversitydish.com and they can find my podcast. They can find the on-demand course. They can also find um, how to get me on as a speaker and how to work with me as a consultant because I do consult with entrepreneurs and especially small business leaders who mm -hmm. want to create cultures that are equitable and inclusive. Excellent. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show. I think thank it was a fantastic conversation, me. another addition to the series. I thank you, the viewer, for watching. Don't forget to click like, comment, and subscribe down below. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Twice as Hard. Thank you so much, Sajrola. Thank you, Janelle. It's been a pleasure.